Salutations respected viewers, this is George from Ireland and this video is an assessment of the late Ian Smith. It's 10 years ago last week since uh, Ian Smith died um, and ironically it came, uh, the anniversary came just at the same time as his nemesis Mugabe was voted out by his own party. Who was Ian Smith? Well, He's best known for having been Prime Minister of the renegade state of Rhodesia from 1965 to 1979. Ian Smith was born in Zimbabwe, as it's now called, in 1919, to a Scots father, English mother. He grew up in a small mining town. His family had a farm with uh, cattle, his father being a butcher. Smith uh, went to university in South Africa. Then the Second World War broke out. Smith volunteered for the RAF. Uh, he was shot down over Italy helped uh, by partisans to escape. Smith doesn't like to say this, but some of those partisans were communists. Some point out that Smith's contribution to the Allied victory was to wreck two perfectly serviceable aircraft. So his reputation as a war hero is perhaps overblown. He returned to South Africa after the war, completed his degree, then he went to Rhodesia, as it was then called, quickly elected to Parliament, age 29, the youngest ever MP. Um, anyway, winds of change were blowing in Africa, African nationalism uh, was uh, becoming uh, more popular. Communist uh, notions were disseminated by the Soviet Union and so forth. Uh, there was a prime minister of uh, Zimbabwe, as we now call it at the time, Sir Garfield Todd, and he recognized that the situation uh, was untenable. The white minority virtually monopolized power. Um, the, there was a council of the chiefs who were paid by the white government and um, they, they weren't elected. Many people said they were not representative of black opinion and they simply rubber stamped whatever the whites wanted. There was tribal law decided by the chiefs and English law decided by the Zimbabwean parliament. But if the two collided, um, English law took, took precedence and there was racial discrimination by law. Um, so the whites of the lion's share of the wealth. And in Harare, then called Salisbury, for instance, Whites comprised 15% of the population, but had 60% of the spending, uh, health spending, that is. So it's simply wrong to let a black person die because his or her community uh, doesn't have that much money. Anyway, Sir Garfield Todd was a New Zealand-born prime minister of Zimbabwe, and he said, things have got to change, and we've got to let the black community have most of the political power. And that was unacceptable to many whites, and he was voted out. Ian Smith formed his own party, the Rhodesian Front, and um, they said, all right, we'll have independence like every other African country. But he wanted Zimbabwe to continue to be largely controlled by people of his color. And the British government said that's unacceptable. Uh, you may have independence like all our other colonies, but only on the basis that the black majority must have uh, most of the power. And Smith and his acolytes wouldn't have this. So on Remembrance Day 1965, they made a unilateral de declaration of independence. It's unilateral on one side because Zimbabwe declared independence without the United Kingdom granting it. So it was illegal and it was denounced such so, so by every other government. No other country, not even South Africa, recognized this breakaway country then called um, Rhodesia. So he was prime minister and um, there were sanctions against his country. Some British companies broke these and traded with him indirectly. Um, South Africa propped them up and I met someone from Zimbabwe and she said she has, was a secretary to a tobacco ranch and they uh, sent tobacco by train to South Africa. As soon as the train crossed the border, all records were destroyed. That tobacco was, was shipped to a Latin American country where it was sold, but obviously this was illegal, so they had to pretend it come from a different country. Um, but uh, anyway, the African nationalist parties, ZANU and ZAPU, they soon started an insurgency, a little bit in the late 60s, really picked up in the 70s. They were armed and trained by the Soviet Union and China. They had bases in Zambia. The Portuguese were overthrown in Mozambique, and so soon they had bases there. And uh, the uh, African nationalists called this the Chimurenga, recalling a failed uprising from the 1890s. Um, some of Smith's supporters called it the Rhodesian Bush War. Um, so Smith had said never in a thousand years would he accept black majority rule in his country. However, um, the military situation was turning against him and the guerrillas were gaining more and more ground and the government had little support. Um, the, the, the whites peaked 8% of the population in 1975. There were black uh, men in the uh, Rhodesian army, particularly in the Rhodesian African Rifles. Uh, right until the end, black men were not allowed to be officers in the Rhodesian army. Um, they changed it the last year or so.
Um, but some people could say, see which way things were going. The writing was on the wall, and some white Zimbabweans uh, fled the country. So uh, by 1979, the guerrillas of Zandla and Zipra controlled half the country, and uh, South Africa was withdrawing support. It cost them too much to support uh, Zimbabwe uh, under white control. Smith, he had been forced to change things, to accept things he said were completely unthinkable, as in the black community having two-thirds of the representation in the parliament. He allowed one party, which was against violence, the United Africans National Council, to stand for elections. And then he stood down as prime minister, allowed a black man to become prime minister of the country for the first time, Bishop Abel Mozarewa. Um, so he was a, um, a man of peace, seemed to be very reasonable, soft-spoken. He was also quite short. The parallels with Dr. King were blatant. But some people said that um, he was a fool, allowing himself to be exploited by Ian Smith to make it appear as though the black community uh, was in charge, when really Ian Smith was holding the whip hand over the majority race. Um, anyway, uh, so Smith uh, said he would fight to the death, but eventually he pulled back from the brink. It wasn't to be. He said it would be a disaster if the Marxists took over. He was always calling his enemies communists, not calling them nationalists, because most people are a little bit nationalistic, and if the black soldiers in the Rhodesian army thought that Zandla and Zipra were primarily nationalists, they might be more attracted to that. I've, I've heard the anecdote that actually a lot of soldiers, black soldiers in the Rhodesian army were somewhat sympathetic uh, to their enemy's agenda, but they lived in poverty and this was the only way to get a decent wage. Some people are apolitical, just take a job, don't really think about it, don't understand these things. Because now it might seem to be astonishing that any black person would fight for a system that discriminated against him. Um, anyway, that was the end of the, of the Bush War. The Lancaster House agreements began in September 1979. Smith returned to uh, Harare in the middle of those for Remembrance Day, but also to assure people the negotiations were going well. That was all signed in December 1979. Elections were held. There was large-scale um, intimidation by Zandla and Zipra, but uh, they won 80% of the vote. Now, even allowing for intimidation, there's no question that they were more popular than Smith's Rhodesian Front or the UANC. So Smith, he was a minister of the government of Mugabe very briefly, and uh, he, he said that he was first of all astonished by Mugabe, who was much more reasonable than he'd, than he'd imagined. And Smith said perhaps he'd been dead wrong about Mugabe all along. Well, things for things went worse. So there's a lot on the debit column for Ian Smith. He um, tried to uphold a system uh, of racial discrimination. No, un, no reasonable person can regret the abolition of such a system. Um, and all he did was prolong the domination by people of his colour for 14 years at the cost of up to 20,000 lives. He said he wanted brighter, brighter, whiter Rhodesia. The only country in the world that supported them was the only officially racist country, South Africa. So um, I, I've, I've heard what some of his backers have to say, and some of it is horrifically racist. There are others who say, well, if, if we have a democracy, we'll have one man, one vote once, and it'll be a dictatorship like so many other countries, or well, things will really go down the pan. Unfortunately, that's proved to be the case. Um, it wasn't necessarily that way. If he'd been reasonable in the 60s and handed over power, perhaps things would have been better. It wasn't inevitable that Mugabe would so, be so bad. It wasn't inevitable that indeed Mugabe would stay in office for so long. Smith was unwilling to see that times had changed. Um, his troops definitely slew civilians and called them terrorist collaborators. Now, it's true much of the civilian population act as the eyes and ears of the guerrillas and supply them with food and delivered weapons and so forth. Smith said he wanted a qualification for the franchise. People must be literate in order to vote. And he claimed every black leader he ever spoke to agreed. Well, um, you know, schooling was all right under him. I mean, a lot of people were illiterate, but he did something about education then. And obviously the 70s was very diff difficult as most money was being spent on the conflict. The economy was going quite well, considering there were sanctions. There was some racial integration right at the end, but only because he was compelled to. Only it was a last ditch attempt to win over some of the black community to his side. As Sun said when he died, at least he tried, of Smith. Um, there's not very much in the credit column, um, and uh, he might be more popular among some black Zimbabweans because things were just so utterly woeful under Mugabe. Uh, overall, I don't think Smith can be highly rated for vision or social justice. The one thing I don't think I can doubt is his sincerity. He did believe what he said, and he was largely unshaken in that uh, until the end. Anyway, he will not be missed.